Hi, I'm Clyde Haberman of the New York Times, filling in for Sam Roberts. There is no shortage of hour-by-hour -hour crises when it comes to New York, from an upsurge in crime, the pandemic, another virus outbreak, to our school system and the blood sport of politics. It all falls under the Metro desk and its new Metro editor, Nesta Ramos, who is with us now. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Can I start with a broad question about where Metro fits in in a newspaper that is clearly in recent years cast itself a, as principally a, a national and international paper? Sure, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a reasonable question, uh, but, you know, Metro is and always has been uh, central to the mission at the Times. It's, you know, we put the New York in the New York Times, of course. Um, and I know that uh, the leadership at the paper has a strong commitment to Metro coverage. Uh, uh, you know, we do it a little bit differently than we used to, but we've got a great team on Metro. Uh, we're doing a lot of hiring on Metro, reporters and editors, uh, which I think is how the institution shows its commitment. Are we ever going to get a separate metro, metro section back again? Or is this one of the, you know, is this like the promised land and the, we'll see maybe in 40 years? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, the, I think that, you know, uh, AG, our publisher, has made his decision on that. Um, uh, and a, as you well know, the way people get their news now um, is broadly has nothing to do with print. Um, uh, you know, right. I, I think there's, there's. I understand the the question and and the and the desire, but the truth is that um, our digital strategy at the times has put us in uh, enviable position in the industry and really allowed us to do the kind of work that we uh, do best. In terms of 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 who is reading the times, uh, obviously also for international and national news, but for metro news. We are quite clearly a city of immigrants, uh, and I would assume that most of the new uh, arrivals do not read the Times. They, in fact, may not read newspapers uh, in general, uh, many of them. Uh, and it's very similar to my family. I'm two of a son of immigrants. They did not read the Times. They read the New York Post, which was a different New York Post in those years. But. Uh, but I did, and my generation did. Is this still happening, this phenomenon of the second generation um, indeed becoming Times readers? Or if they are, are they reading the physical paper? Is it, is it, are we really in a digital age and guy, a geezer like me should give up on, <laughs> on, on the print paper? Uh, I don't think anybody should give up on the okay, print paper. I it's, I agree, it's, but. It, you know, it's still uh, important to our to our identity and our operation, and we um, we have a lot of good people working on that product specifically um, for good reason. Our, those, our, our print readers are, are, are loyal and well-informed, um, and we want to make sure that we provide them a great uh, product every day. Uh, in terms of the, the broader question, um, you know, uh, my father came here from, from Puerto Rico, which is not immigrating per se, uh, because it's uh, part of the United States. Not technically, but... Uh, not but, technically, but you understand the parallel. Terms, sure. um, and, you know, his, one of his first jobs was delivering the newspaper. He drove a, drove a truck with the New Haven Register and uh -huh. threw the big bundles out the door. And, uh, you know, he read, he read the paper a little bit. On my mother's side, my grandmother read the New York Times until she went blind. And even then, she had a big contraption. She'd peer into a little <laughs> light and move the paper around almost like a microfilm. Uh, reading, reading every word. I love um, her already. <laughs> um, so, so I do think that it's all over the map. I think part of our mission on Metro is to reach those new audiences that you're describing by, uh, and, and key to that is uh, making sure that they see themselves in our coverage. Um, and we've been uh, really trying to push in the direction of uh, stories that are about what it's like to live in New York right now. Um, and a lot of that is is people who came here recently, yeah. um, uh, people of all sure. different faiths and races and gender identities. And um, we're trying to capture that in our coverage in a way that will naturally draw those readers in. You come to the Times uh, from uh, that great city, that dread city too, to the north, Boston. Uh, um, are, and you've, you've worked in other cities. Uh, are urban issues basically the same everywhere I assume there are many issues that overlap in a bunch of cities, but to what, what issues are you finding 
uh, in New York that are really different from, let's say, Boston, a, a major a major city itself, of course? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, New York is is unique. Uh, right. It's it's you know by a by a by a level of magnitude larger, and uh, it's sort of inherently more um, uh, integrated than a lot of. Uh, American cities, a lot of the cities I've worked in, whether it's Rochester, upstate, or um, uh, where I grew up in New Haven, um, uh, Boston to a large degree, mm -hmm. uh, you've got um, largely white suburbs surrounding a, a right. poor people of color, largely communities of color in the city. That's not really the case in New York. Um, uh, there's some of that, but it's not, it's not stark the way it is around in other mid-sized cities around the country. Um, I don't think, if I can interrupt, I don't think Boston, uh, New York rather, had the, the the inherent racial hostility that Boston obviously did with the school busing issue, yeah. let's say in the 70s. I'm sure. not saying New York has been a, you know, a, a paradise in terms of racial and religious harmony, but um, I don't think we ever got quite as horrible as Boston did during that period. Yeah, I mean, I think getting along that way is a part of New York's identity in the way that is, a, is, is not in Boston, that Boston's historical identity is really troubled in that regard. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, though every, I would say that every American city has, has roots that are, that are oh, yeah. rotten if you look at them. Yeah, I'm not suggesting we're a kumbaya, you know, uh, yeah. bastion here, but it, again, Boston was somewhat unique in that regard, I, I would Yeah, it really came to the surface there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the, the suburbs. Uh, there was a time, and it's been quite a few years now, that the Times had weekly uh, sections for Westchester, for New Jersey, uh, Long Island. Uh, I'm not uh, proposing that those be returned, but will our coverage of the suburbs be different, you think, than it has been in recent years? Or are we a five borough focused uh, metro section? No, metro covers New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, um, uh, top to bottom. And, uh, you know, I think we want to be smart and strategic about the stories we tell in the suburbs and make them broadly applicable. Certainly, there are issues, you know, we've, we're seeing a polio outbreak in Rockland County, right? So, right. potentially, not an outbreak right. yet, but we're, we saw a case and uh, there were indications that it might be spreading wider. Um, in the wastewater studies, et cetera. This is not confined basically to a Hasidic... Uh, uh, it's, it affects people uh, who are unvaccinated, yeah. but... Um, but Rockland, to me, suggests... We had, right, true. But, but my, my point is to your question, yeah. um, you know, that's an, that's, a, that's an example where we want to focus our sure. energy on one particular community. In terms of, in terms of our broader uh, coverage strategy, it's about finding stories that are applicable across communities. Um, uh, and there are a lot of those. We have, we have good reporters devoted to, to upstate, to the region, to New Jersey. Um, and and they're, they're fundamentally looking for stories that help our readers there and everywhere understand their world. Are there new areas of coverage that you're thinking of? I mean, the, we, we certainly cover what are traditional areas, covering City Hall, covering the police, mm -hmm. covering mm -hmm. uh, transportation, which is enormously important uh, everywhere, but especially in a city like this. Are there new beats that you have in mind? Um, over the years, beats have come and gone to some degree. Of course. But, um, yes, there uh, are. So what's, um, what's uh, on your agenda? One of our biggest focuses in the year to come is going to be uh, a team of reporters who are focusing on what we're talking about is the future of New York, right? Mm. We used to talk about this like the recovery. That's not really what we're talking about anymore, I don't think. We're talking about how New York at this pivotal moment is going to emerge and how the decisions we make now are going to shape the future, um, whether it's this massive Penn Station project right. uh, or, or what, how, we, how we do or don't stabilize the MTA. Um, so we have, a, we have a new editor, grew up in Inwood, Zeke Manaya, working with a really talented team. I grew up in Inwood. All right, well you should meet Zeke. <laughs> um, re working with a really talented team of reporters, um, uh, looking at economic issues and the, the affordability, what really seems like an affordability crisis right now. Um, and trying to put that in perspective for readers so that they understand how what's happening now will shape New York for years and decades to come. So that's one. I think we need to devote somebody to covering the marijuana industry for a little while. Mm. Um, as the state sort of props up an industry, there are, huge, there are big concerns around equity. It's changing the smell of the city, I would <laughs> say. Um, and, you know, I think at least for... for for a year, maybe, we need to have somebody really looking hard at that, both from a cultural perspective and an accountability perspective. 
Do you have people racing to be on the pot beat, or is this? Uh... <laughs> We've got some good candidates, but it's people who take it seriously, right? I mean, sure. Um, uh, because you know, one of the fascinating things that's that the state is trying to do is succeed where others have failed yeah. in using this opportunity to uh, make amends to some of the communities that were really badly affected by the war on drugs. I assume that would include a criminal justice component of people who were, you know, given long prison sentences for something that is now not illegal. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And a lot of those convictions are being vacated. And, you know, th as I said, the state is being really intentional about making those first, giving those first licenses, which were potentially quite lucrative, to people who had those convictions. Is it necessary for a, a Metro reporter in a city like this to be multilingual? Spanish would obviously be the, the, the second language of choice, but Lord knows we have many more languages around than that. So yeah, it, ne so necessary, the... no. Um, you know, my Spanish is not good. Uh, is it an important thing we look at in hiring and in staffing assignments? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we've we've expanded our list of uh, interpreters mm. who we can call on at a moment's notice. We just had a reporter out yesterday talking to folks through an interpreter who we hired for the day. Um, May I ask what language? It was a Spanish interpreter. We have several Spanish-speaking reporters, right. but not all of them, and right. we don't want to, you know, shoehorn people into particular stories just because of their language skills. Right. Um, uh, but. You know, it's something that is that is, but particularly Spanish, but not only Spanish, is is critically important to how we, how we, you know, having grown up in a multilingual family. Yeah, yeah, sort no, of I mean, look, we have a large uh, Hindi population. We have totally. a large totally. Hindi population. And look, it's Everybody unrealistic that we would have a reporter who right. speaks every language that's spoken in the city I, because that's almost every language in the world. I was going to say, I think that's <laughs> close to impossible. Right, but we can. There are some some ways that we can. Make a, the, the key thing is to is to sort of know what our shortcoming is yeah, there and fair enough. figure out how to. We've only got a, about a minute left, but I can't let you go without asking. I came across in preparing for our talk. You, there you were in Boston, in a costume called Slide the Fox, the uh, soccer team. What was that about? Oh yeah, so I was a columnist for a while in right. Boston, and it was a, it's a that's you know one of the most fun jobs in the world, as you know. Columnist for sure. Um, and uh, and got invited down for the New England Revolution is the MLS team down there. Right, the and they said and they 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 had read my work I guess and had asked me to come down and 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 try it out for the day, see how it is. And if you think it's hot out there this week, I would <laughs> encourage you to put on this 40-pound hairy uh, fox suit and and stagger around while kids kick soccer balls at your face. All right, fair enough. I still want to be bat boy for the Yankees for a day. I don't <laughs> think it's going to happen. Anyway, I could try. Thank you. New York Times Metro editor Nesta Ramos. Up next, New York, boom or bust. Depending on which way you see it, New York is either booming in post-pandemic infrastructure projects or it's teetering on the brink of economic disaster. It's probably somewhere in between. Patrick McGeehan writes about all this for the New York Times. Uh, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, Vincent Scully, I'm referring to the art historian by that name, not the Dodgers broadcaster who died the other day, uh, famously said years ago that, uh, referring to Penn Station, the old Penn Station versus the new, saying uh, about the old, one entered the city like a king, one scuttles in now like a rat. Uh, and um, you're, you've written about plans to revamp this uh, rat cage. Um, how realistic? What's the, what are the plans? What's the cost? Well, it's very complicated because uh, <laughs> it's like going to be very else, expensive. Yeah. Right. And, uh, Seven million? Seven billion is the working estimate. That means fourteen billion <laughs> that the probably. state is using, yeah. uh, just to renovate the existing station, not to make it into oh. the palatial right. building it once was, right. or you know build a new one. It's just to to fix what's there, and they've got to figure. They're trying to figure out how to pay for that, uh, which is always. Uh, a complicated issue. And the most likely thing would be a combination of state and federal aid, floating bonds. Right. The, the, pl the general plan is to get the federal government to pay for half of it and New York and New Jersey to split the other half because so many New Jersey commuters use it on a daily basis. But they are renovating it now, right? I mean, uh, to some degree or not? Well, since they built 
Moynihan, uh, Moynihan Station, Moynihan which is Station, a train hall, is a nice a, hall across the way that used right. to be the big old post office. Right. Uh, they've moved, Amtrak has basically decamped from Penn Station, which it owns, right. into Moynihan, where it's a tenant. But uh, that has opened up room for, for, to maneuver to do some gussying up, but not what Governor Hochul has in mind, which is a whole right. renovation of the entire place. Which, frankly, I think it, it needs, right? I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I, I, I mean, Scully wasn't wrong about the, the feel of, of the place. No, it's, uh, it, it's general, I mean, the governor calls it a hell hole, uh, which is, you know, not unfair, I don't not think. Unfair, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mess and uh, it's very cramped and it's, it's right. underground and there's no natural light in there. It's a dark, cramped place. Yeah, no, it's terrible. Um, the plan, as I saw uh, reading you, it, it includes a bunch of office buildings. Now, in this post, I don't even know if we are post-COVID, but even when we are, who's going to fill these buildings? I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the point of having a whole bunch of more office buildings is. Well, th there is a, question, a big question about whether there's going to be demand for all that office space, but this is the New York model, is to pay for public realm improvements by letting developers build bi big glass buildings. And that's the plan here at Penn Station. It was the plan that Governor Cuomo cooked up and Governor Hochul has bought into. But is that realistic? Surely there are developers who say, well, what's the point of putting up a, a 40, 50, 60 story building if I can't fill it? Well, the developers seem to think that they're going to be able to really? fill them. The, the, the history in New York is that everybody gravitates to the new, spot, the new places. So yeah. Hudson Yards, which is the the last big development right, like this. The old new thing. Right, <laughs> that uh, it's not full yet, but a lot of big tenants have moved their corporations, have moved their headquarters there, well, they, uh, vacating what was the old new thing, right? The, the previous new thing. The, right. So they moved from Times Square office towers or Fifth Avenue office towers into Hudson Yards. And certainly the developers of these buildings around Penn Station will be trying to lure the, the people who moved to Hudson Yards to move to Penn Station. <laughs> Um, is Hudson Yards considered successful or not? I mean, my sense is it's kind of a bust, but I, I confess I also haven't been there a lot during this COVID period. Well, they haven't finished building it, and yeah. it's not full. Um, so it's, it's not a roaring success, but uh, the, the state seems to think that it's a, a, an excellent model for what they want to do at Penn Station. They, they look at Hudson Yards as a success, I think the jury's still out. Right. Um, you know, they had, for instance, a giant department store there that closed almost immediately and, and has remained vacant. Which one was that? That was the Neiman Marcus Neiman, store. Neiman, uh, um, so right. uh, there's, the retail is sort of working and the office is kind of filling up. Restaurants? And, uh, you know, so it's not dead, but it's not thriving, I'd say. Does the plan for uh, Penn Station include what do we do with Madison Square Garden? Uh, the city, the city struck a very inartfully worded um, uh, deal with Madison Square Garden during the Koch administration. And if I have this right, since the 1980s, Madison Square Garden hasn't paid a penny in property taxes to the city, uh, um, which doesn't make it a particularly good tenant. Uh, uh, but are there, it, are there plans to move it some way that's come up periodically or is this not on the table? I think everyone other than the owners of Madison Square Garden <laughs> agrees that the best thing for Penn Station would be to move the garden from on top of it to somewhere else in because. the city. Um, because then you could build a, an actual train hall, you know, like something like, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be as grand as Penn Station once was, something but, but something uh, fitting yeah. of, you know, an, a portal to New York City. Yeah. Uh, you can't really do that now with the arena sitting on top of right. it. But there's no, the, the plan now is to go ahead with Madison Square Garden in place. There's no serious talk about moving. Although I think the Moynihan Hall is quite grand. It may not have the, you know, the, the elegance of the old Penn Station or, or in my view, Grand Central, but um, it, it's, it's a rather impressive public space, I think. 
Oh, I, yeah. I think it's yeah. it's lovely. And I was recently yeah. in the food court there, and it was it was humming. There were, yeah, yeah. were a lot of people in for lunch. It, you know, it seems like it's coming to life. Uh, yeah, no, it's good to see. It's good to see. Now you have to deal with uh, the basics of what a train terminal are for. Uh, trains. Uh, there's not enough tracks, right? So, what happens in that regard? And I guess the related question is. Uh, um, Gateway, the new name now for the uh, endless plans, never uh, coming to fruition for a third tunnel under the uh, under the Hudson, which clearly uh, we need and got stymied in good part, I think, because of uh, Chris Christie's uh, refusal to go along with it. Um, where does that all stand? Is that is that indeed going to uh, move forward? Well, so right simultaneous to this Penn Station machinations, we have. That what's considered the most important public works project in the country, b putting this new rail tunnel under the Hudson before right. the hundred year old ones that are there fail completely. Right. Uh, but, and that's what the railroads want. The railroads are, are focused on increasing capacity between New York City and New Jersey and the rest of the East Coast. Uh, but <clears throat> at the moment, that plan is still in the works. You know, it, it isn't fully funded. Uh, they're, they're, the Biden administration has moved the ball pretty far forward right. to get the tunnel built. But once those, if you do that and you double the capacity to get to Penn Station, you need more tracks at Penn Station um, or to run the trains right. somewhere else out to Long Island or somewhere. So all of that is still to be worked out. And it's not part of Governor Hochul's current vision. Her vision is fix up Penn Station. Right, but again, Trains exist to run on tracks. You need you need the tracks, and and to what degree is it dependent on uh, political uh, developments like Democrats staying in control of the House, which is iffy at best, uh, or, or Democrats controlling the White House for that matter? Uh, uh, I, I might have thought in in a more generous moment that the previous president, being a New Yorker, would have been amenable to that, but of course he wasn't. So. No, Donald Trump was no friend of the Gateway Project or Penn Station improvements. He didn't, he didn't really do anything. He, in some ways, blocked progress on it. And right now, they have the best political conditions they're ever going to have. Joe Biden loves trains and infrastructure, right. well, and he, he, he put money in, you know, yeah. got money through Congress for this purpose. But, you know, they, they're, they're moving kind of slowly, uh, given the fact that uh, we're facing midterms that might change that calculus. I haven't been on an airplane since the start of COVID. Uh, are, are LaGuardia and Kennedy really as glorious as I'm hearing, reading, including reading you? Well, Kennedy's a work in progress, but yeah. LaGuardia is startlingly I should go out there, <laughs> improved. Uh, you know, I like to say it's been a banner year in Queens, right? Uh, yeah. the, the Mets don't stink and <laughs> LaGuardia doesn't stink anymore, you know. It, but does it, it, it can handle large numbers of travelers now? I mean, that was always a problem was capacity. Well, they, they didn't really do anything about capacity. Uh, LaGuardia is still a tiny little airport in a big city, and uh, they, ha they didn't add any runway space or anything like that. They made it a little easier for the planes to move around, but what they really did was make it the interior, the waiting areas, much more pleasant. Listen, this is part of what you cover uh, in terms of uh, economic development in, in the metro area. Uh, do you have a sense of the future of the city as a workplace? I, I'm, I, are we going to be... Uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, a, 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 a three-day-a-week perhaps come to the office uh, city, if that is, are we a Zoom city from here on in? And how does that affect all the businesses that depend on uh, a, a regular flow of office workers, from restaurants to uh, clothing stores to whatever? Yeah, I wouldn't want to own a chain of, of lunch spots in Midtown anymore. Uh, the, those places used to have lines out the door. At, sure. uh, you know, middle of the afternoon, you couldn't get a salad without waiting in line. Right. But uh, that's all changed, and how degree to which it's going to return is, is still, you know, a, an open question. But I do think we're looking at a lot more flexible work rules in most businesses. Although I did read recently that law firms are going in a different direction and most law firms are having everybody in the office every day. Well, it helps a lot of uh, types of work. I think our line of work, for example, to have people 
you know, be physically near one another. You, you schmooze with people, and the next thing you know, you have an idea for a news story. I assume it's true for lawyers and true for businessmen, too, no? Well, the, there, there obviously were reasons why we, we decided on these kind of yeah. workspaces where everybody got together. So they, they, there obviously were benefits. You know, whether we'll weigh them the same way we used to is you know, still to be determined. I think. And very quickly, because we have less than a minute, how does a young person afford living in this city, especially if one wants to live in Manhattan? Is that an impossibility? I, I'm amazed that when I see the, what rents coming. are in New yeah. York that people are still coming. I you don't know, get we, it. We only had a little dip there, and now every, everybody's rushing back in, and it's, I think it's a lot of young people who want to live in a city. In, yeah, but does that mean that there are three and four to an apartment sharing the rent? Is it that basically? Yeah. Yes, I think there's a lot of bunking, a lot of All right. uh, it, All right. uh, partial... I, 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 <laughs> I don't get it. I mean, God bless them. I'm, I want to see them here, but the rents make my nose bleed. Um, thank you, Patrick McGeehan. For everyone here at CUNY TV, I'm Clyde Haberman of the New York Times. Thank you for watching.